Well, hello everybody. God bless you. Brother Brian here. In this video, we are going to continue. This is day two. We are going to read Ephesians 2 according to the suggestion that the Lord gave his prophet, elder prophet Mike Thompson. And this is all in preparation for February because the Lord said in February we launch. So let's get to it. Today is January 10th, 2022. And here I am ready, ready to go into Ephesians 2, and we will see what the Lord has. We'll see how much he has to say, how much he will quicken me and, and lead me, uh, jumping around the word, confirming with cross references, should maybe testimonies will come out, experiences, visions, dreams, and whatnot. I am so blessed to read many of the comments. Um, it, a lot are coming in, and today has been quite a day. Um, and I had an un unexpected um, challenge today, as I well, as it took about two, three hours or so of my day, and I was unable to do a lot of things. So it's a little late today, but here I am, and I just sat with the Lord. I just worshipped for about fifteen minutes or so and i sat still praying in tongues quietly and next thing you know i just came to uh 45 minutes later i had some beautiful worship music and my spirit was just just taking it in i feel i feel absolutely refreshed just sitting in god's presence so i too am doing my part and then the reading part is here together all right so let's do that Father, we give you all the honor. We are so grateful for you, Lord. Every day you show up, you are with us. For everything you've done, everything you do, and everything you are going to do in our lives, we give you thanks. We thank you in advance because you are good, always good, absolutely good, faithful, merciful, just, forgiving gracious you bless us and give us beyond our needs we thank you for the holy spirit and we invite you father lord jesus and holy spirit to be with us now and manifest yourself as you are doing more and more each time and i'm so thankful that you and your presence goes forth through the airwaves and touches the people and that your presence come upon them. I pray it happens more and more in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Ephesians 2. <clears throat> Once more, I'm reading out of the New King James Version. And it says this. The subheader of the chapter is By Grace Through Faith. And you he made alive. You were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, let me briefly look something up. Something just came up in my mind, and I want to compare here. All right. So first thing that pops up to me is the Lord is telling us that he made us alive. What does that mean? Well, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them perfect. And in, in an earth that was perfect without any sign of sin. But the enemy, through a serpent, caused even Adam to question what they already had. So the serpent asked, knowing somehow what the Lord God had said. And he says to Eve, has God told you? 
Has God said? You remember when he says that? And he questions. And then Eve responds, Oh no, God said we can eat of every tree in the, in the garden of Eden, but not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because, okay, now this is something I learned through Kevin Zadai which is absolutely amazing. And I'll see how far I go into the testimony because there may be parts of it were, oh, if somebody says, oh, I, where is that in scripture? As if 66 books can contain the fullness of God. There is something called the spirit of revelation, which takes us beyond, but it doesn't come against scripture. It doesn't bump scripture as Robin Bullock says. So we'll see. But basically, what happened there is we were once alive beforehand, before sin. The moment that Adam and Eve sinned, spiritually speaking, they died. But there was so much glory, so much life, so much Zoe life in uh, in greek the word for one of the translations and meanings of the word life is zoe life and so there was so much life of god because of his glory on the earth and what he had just made this is the reason why it took many generations for people back then to die and so adam died you know, just over 900 years, he lived 900 and something, some odd years. I think it was 930. And so, you know, they got to see their children's 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 children, etc. But when they died, it's like their spirit. It's like it. It's like it shrunk within them. And what I mean by that is that they were created in the image and likeness of God. God is light. And many have testified when being caught up to heaven, when they've seen the Lord, whether the Lord Jesus or the Father, they've been taken to see the Father. And nearly everybody says it's so bright, they could, you could barely you know, see an image. Some people say you know, they couldn't even look, and that's all, in, that's all depends on the Lord, what He wills during that supernatural experience. So it's up to God how much we see and, and so forth. And he does it according to our faith and other things. So when Adam and Eve were created, there they were they were spiritual beings with a living soul in a physical body. But their spirit was emanating from them. So they were beings of light like God, not God, like God. And so the enemy comes to Eve and he attempts to get her to question, has God said? And then she said what she said about the tree. And then the serpent, the devil through the serpent says, God does not want you to be like him, basically. So let's turn there to have the exact, the exact wording, and then we'll continue here. All right, Genesis chapter three, verse two. And the woman said to the serpent, this is responding, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, God was talking spiritual death. Physical death also came to pass. But as I was mentioning, the reason why they lived so long is because of the glory. Now, can you imagine even in the sinful fallen state that Adam and Eve uh, were transformed into because of their sin? Even at that, it took centuries for them to die. Can you imagine? So, 
Verse 4, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Notice something. The devil is the father of lies. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But the devil also knows how to twist things. And he words things to where much can be true, but yet he adds something that's false, making the entire thing false, or a lie, or a deception, or he omits something, and therefore it's still a lie or a deception. So here he says, God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Well, what happened when they did it? The Bible says that their eyes were opened. Look at verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So the devil didn't lie there. The devil said in verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. That was true. And you will be like God. I'll come back to that in a moment. And the last part, knowing good and evil. That was true. But the middle part, you will be like God. That right there was the lie. Why was that a lie? Because they were all ready like God. Hear me clearly. I, I can, I know the religious spirit is coming up in, in some people. No, I didn't say they were God. I said they were like God. If you have a problem with that, then you're going to have to explain why God said in Genesis 1, verse 26, saying, Then God said, Let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Creator is one, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So now we're back to chapter 3 and verse 4. You will be like God. They were already like God. So you see, the devil tried to entice them to do something wrong in disobedience to God, telling them as if they were missing out on something. And this is what I learned through Kevin Zadai. They were already like God. But the devil convinced them that God was holding something back. Oh, that punk. That punk devil. And so... Eve made the mistake. She chose wrong. And she said, when the woman saw that it was tr uh, the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, why would they need to be wiser than God already made them? You see, they, on they were created to only know that which is good. Because if they were to have known that evil exists, then their soul, because they had a living soul, God breathed the breath of life into them, they became a living soul, then they would have the ability, which is the will, right? The will part of the soul, will, mind, emotions, their will, God knowing the human nature, they would have the ability to choose between good and evil. But if but the Lord made them perfect to where they only knew good so they could only choose good. But the devil came in. And he, it's almost like he brought to light, he brought to awareness the possibility of something called evil, knowing good and evil. And this is the part which is going to probably bother a lot of people. But I'm going to say it either way because the Lord said it through Kevin Zadai and I understood it and I know how a revelation works and I know that there is more to God than, is than that which is written in here. And it doesn't bump scripture. But God, God showed Kevin Zadai that the Lord, just as it says in the Word, that the Lord would... Let me see where he where he said it exactly. Oh yes, afterwards, you're right, Lord. Okay. 
uh, chapter 3, verse 8 of Genesis. So this is after they sinned, all right? They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So what does that mean? The Lord would visit with them. He, that's why he created men and, and women. He created them to have a family, to fellowship with them. Not only to worship him. I know a lot of people say God created us to worship him. I mean... You can say yes, but I, I kind of like to challenge that in a sense because God had angels that already worshipped him. Why did he need human beings? See, it was for something more. And then if you are willing to accept that, which, I mean, I just explained it pretty in a pretty simple form, then you would also understand that when we go to heaven, it's not that we're going to worship God all eternity forever and ever and that's all we're going to do that kind that's kind of narrow-minded it's kind of limited this is why cat kerr has been shown by god by thousands of visitations to heaven and also kim robinson and also Don, thank you lord donna rigney and i'm gonna name another one that people are not gonna like well, like it or not, it's true. Jesse Duplantis, when he went to heaven as well. If you go and listen to his testimony, or he, which he did recently in the last year. Oh, my Lord. There's such, there's such an anointing on that testimony. I remember just crying tears just out of joy, out of sheer joy. Because you can compare and hear the confirmation between so many other things that Kat Kerr and others have experienced in heaven. And... Um, and so forth so um, don't get caught up on people and, and what the world has presented as them because I, I actually learned the truth about Jesse Duplantis and others through Hank Kuhneman through Kevin Zadai through Robin Bullock the things they have said and I and I remember repenting and then opening my heart for the Lord to reveal to me the truth of how is it why is it that there is so much freedom and and finances and so forth and then i learned the truth and you know when people obey god he knows how to open the windows of heaven and one of the things that, that kevin said i learned from jesse duplantis is the the constant praying in the spirit which even paul said i i talking to the corinthians i pray more than all of you all referring to praying in the spirit now it doesn't mean praying with understanding which is in english or hebrew you know whatever they spoke during the time he meant praying in tongues unknown tongues so if the, if, even though paul the apostle said that one should earnestly desire spiritual gifts prophecy above that he emphasized love is the greatest and it's true but it doesn't mean that prophecy shouldn't be desired and it doesn't mean that tongues is ineffective Someone was recently commenting about that. Um, it, it's good to ask questions, but we should be careful not to speak with, with certainty about things you have never experienced, nor have you walked in, because then you're speaking from the point of inexperience, and you're speaking to those who walk in it, and though you don't understand, the approach should be asking questions with the intent of understanding, not ask, not asking questions and bringing up arguments as if you're a lawyer, you know, with this mindset of like a Pharisee, because that, that doesn't please God. And so people like that, I will not respond to, because I don't have time, you know, and their, their, their heart is not open. So we will get to tongues and, and so forth in a teaching soon. Um, so anyway, yes. So the Lord would walk in the cool of the day, Genesis 3 verse 8, which means the Lord visited his creation, Adam and Eve, daily. He walked with them. He talked with them. He visited them. Can you imagine what they talked about and, and so forth? And so, this is what the Lord showed Kevin Zadai, that the Lord would actually come down and in front of Adam and Eve, the Lord himself would take from the take fruit from the tree of knowledge of the knowledge of good and evil 
and would eat in front of them, already having told them they may not eat, for in the day that they eat, they will die. So when I heard this, I was like, huh, and I thought about it. See, I did not immediately like, oh, you know, false doctrine and all this stuff. We all need to just calm down. Just, just calm down. <laughs> there is so much fruit of the Holy Spirit shown through Kevin Zedai. So knowing that I have remained open and that the Lord teaches me, because I'm teachable, the Holy Spirit reveals the truth. And if I don't understand, I just kind of file it somewhere in the back. And eventually the Lord begins, brings revelation, whether it be that same day, weeks later, months later, years later, de decades later. I've had things revealed to me decades after. And I just rejoice because God is good. We don't have to understand everything at the moment, okay? Now, the Lord said to Kevin Zedai that, why did he do that? He said, because God was showing Adam and Eve that he is God. He is the creator. He, though he made them to be like him, they are not him. And they, Adam and Eve, are not God. So God purposely would do that. And he was also showing them this. Like if I had to put it in my own words, it's as if God was taken from the fruit, eaten in front of them. The one he said, do not eat from here, as if saying, I am the only one so perfect and so holy and so mighty that I can handle knowing good and knowing what is evil and always do good and never be tempted by evil. So he was showing his supreme power and authority. So in this, it kept Adam and Eve in check. So if you are willing to accept this revelation, then I'm happy for you. It doesn't hurt you whether you do believe it or whether you don't believe it. So that is that. But revelation is awesome because like I said, John 21, 25, let's hop over there real fast. And I will prove to you the scripture that the Holy Spirit once gave me when somebody was arguing with me on Instagram a couple years back saying that revelation is over, etc., etc., And I was like, Lord, what, what do I say to this person? Because I wanted to, you know, respond. And boom, like this, the Holy Spirit gave me this answer. And I was like, whoa. Even I was like absolutely stunned and astounded at the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. John. Oops, I went too far. <clears throat> John 21, verse 25. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Boom. It's like a mic drop right there. God said that. Not me. God. By His Spirit. Okay, so we were talking about how Adam and Eve were alive to begin with. But then they died. And when they sinned and their eyes were opened, they were open to the awareness of what evil was. And they realized they disobeyed God. And the light that was emanating from them, right? Because they were like God. They li God lives in light. God is light and he lives in, in the glory, which is a light. The light in Adam and Eve that was shining from them, all of a sudden, it shrunk back within them. Then, check this out. Some of you are going to go like, whoa, because this is what I had learned and it makes sense. Now look, verse, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise... She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave her husband, she gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They were beings of light. They, they were covered and shrouded in light. So they didn't know what they looked like, in, uh, what their body looked like. 
when the light came back and shrunk because they died spiritually, all of a sudden they saw their body and they knew they were naked. But before that, they were it was all light. They didn't see their body. Oof. And so they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So then the whole idea that they ate from an apple tree, this also I learned through Kevin Zadai. Um, if you all of a sudden find out you're naked, you're going to grab the first thing, the closest thing to your, to where you are, right? And if they had just eaten the fruit, then what they had eaten was from a fig tree, right? Makes sense, right? Very cool, all this revelation from the Lord. Okay, so this is, this is what happened. They died. All right, so now we are back. Uh, Lord, thank you for reminding me why we jumped over there. Now we are going back to Ephesians chapter 2. And wow, we did... We definitely went off, but God is good because this may come in handy for you to know. All right, so for those of you who are still here, <laughs> God has called me to people to help them grow to maturity. So it's not just for anybody. You remember, uh, I remember in the book of John when Jesus would tell people things that were very difficult to accept saying that they, he who does not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood will not have eternal life in him. It's kind of harsh, kind of sounds like cannibalism, you know. Probably like, dude, what are you talking about, Jesus? Who are you? And how, how dare you tell us this? See, it didn't make sense. But those who remained, because they knew, it was, they, they didn't understand it, but they were willing to stay with him. Why? Because even Jesus at one point when he was saying this and all these people left, he turned to his disciples. Now remember this, sorry, let me see if the Lord can show me where this is. Because this is a very, very good point, which is something you're going to be able to relate to and remember when you are interacting with people. Not necessarily to, to say something against them, but to be aware and have that discernment. All right, so we're in the book of John. Show me, Lord. Okay. Give me a second. I believe I found it here. I'm looking in John chapter 6. Okay. Oh, yes. Thank you, Lord. All right. So here we are. Um, chapter 6 of the book of John, verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, this, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? You see, they were bothered because they didn't understand something. Remember, just because we don't understand doesn't mean it's not true. But will we endure? Will we remain? Will we abide with God, no, holding on to we, what we know is true, even if we hear something from that source or person who walks with the Lord, just because they some, say something hard or far-fetched doesn't mean it's not true. But see, those who remain and abide and don't just abandon God, God rewards them with the revelation in time. So, uh, verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? <laughs> so many people are easily offended by the truth. But, um, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend? Oh, there's that word, ascend, ascension. See, I told you it's not new age. Um, okay. Devil's just a copycat. He just takes it and makes it look evil. All right. So these are secret, deeper secrets that even I myself have not fully understood. Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. 
the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe him and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it is it has been granted to him by my father. Whoa. From that time on, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Oh, my Lord. I just realized that it literally says many of his disciples. Now, that's not the 12 apostles. Many of his disciples, not many of these people who were just in crowds, disciples, people who had been following him, they abandoned him just by, because they were hearing deeper things they couldn't understand after seeing miracles and such. Verse 67, and then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? Imagine that. Jesus is standing there. Many of his disciples leave him. And he just immediately turns around to the 12. Do you also want to go away? Didn't sound too loving, but it wasn't rude. He was so focused on doing the work of God. He was even willing, it would seem, to lose those 12. Because either way, he was going to obey God at all costs, regardless of the public opinion or opinion of those who love God or say they love God, whether it be true or not true, his focus was to obey his father. So he said, do you also want to go away? Verse 68. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe. See, he was focused on what he already knew. We have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. They didn't abandon him. So, all right. So then there's that. So that is important to know. I hope that is helpful to you. It will be foundational for you to understand when you hear something that is just a little bit off. Doesn't mean you just immediately abandon it. Know enough of the word to know that if someone says something far-fetched, to recognize if it is demonic or evil or if it glorifies Satan. If it doesn't check any of those boxes, but yet it still doesn't make sense, seek God. You should already be seeking God and know how to seek God so that you can hear from him. And in time, don't let it bother you. Don't be offended. In time, let him reveal it to you. It's also a sign of not being a... a how can I say, of wanting to mature and not having a mature re reaction, right? Like, like the people who just abandoned the Lord Jesus. So, all right, we're back on to Ephesians and we are on verse three, but let me read what we just read so that it ties in why we jumped over to Genesis and, and the story of the sin when it came in and so forth. Verse one, and you he made alive. It's because we were dead in our sins, remember? The light just went in. That's why the moment we're born again, the Holy Spirit enters in our, into us as the seed of God, as the book of 1 John says, chapter 2, I believe, and He joins with our spirit and brings our spirit back to life. All of a sudden, that's like a spark. It comes alive again. He made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Now, if you look in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul, by the Holy Spirit, tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but rather be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, that means that you may see, find out, realize, what is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God? So see, in order to know the will of God, you need to have your mind renewed. And in order to have your mind renewed, which is a process of transformation, you have to not be conforming to the world, but conforming to the word. And the word in the flesh is Jesus as well. So sometimes you need to reverse engineer 
things to find out where you need to start to see where you are in the process okay so verse 2 in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, Check that out. Past tense. Paul is speaking. Past tense. Raised us up together and made us, that's you and me, sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, oh, oh, there's, there's that scripture again, ages to come. This time it doesn't say age, but it says ages, which is interesting. I had never seen that. In the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So basically, he's going to love us and bless us so much that he's going to show us off to those in the ages to come. At least that's how it sounds like to me. Because we were in Christ Jesus. Not just saved, but we lived in Christ we sought him to become mature, to have that union with him, which is a mystery. And the, word, uh, the root word for mystery in Greek is mysterion, which is connected to the words mysticism, mystic, and such. Now, Paul used that word mystery a lot of times. And that, that again, is going to offend some unlearned Christians or ignorant believers. And it doesn't mean that they're bad or anything. It just means you just don't know. That if you don't seek it out, you're just going to call everything evil that you don't understand. And that doesn't seem very mature, right? So, a mystic, if you look it up in the dictionary, simply means one who seeks union with God. The many of the early church fathers in the first few centuries after Jesus were mystics. They had such incredible um, raptures and powerful manifestations of the Holy Spirit being transported and, you know, physically and, and seen in one place and, and, and still in another place. You're like, oh, that's impossible. Yes, with man, but not when you're in Christ. Is not Christ everywhere? Are we not in him? See, what I'm saying makes sense, but yet at the same time, you're like, but how? God has shown you it makes sense. So we just need to hang in there and keep seeking and so forth. And so notice here what it says in verse 6. He made us to sit together in heavenly places. Remember heavenly places we talked about in uh, the teaching of the book of John, John 14, when the Lord says that he goes to prepare a place for us. His, in his Father's house there are many, many rooms, many mansions, many realms, many dwelling places, many... What was that last word, Father? Dimensions. Yes, dimensions. So here we are again in heavenly places, in heavenly realms, in heavenly dimensions, in Christ, because Christ is the door. The Holy Spirit going through Christ, all of a sudden he has, we can be traveling in the Spirit, not at our own will at this point, the Holy Spirit as our guide. I believe that there is a point of maturity when we walk so close with the Lord that at will we could do this. That is like, that seems like beyond human, but is anything impossible with the Lord? I don't believe so. And I'm looking forward to that because I would like to know how to visit heaven every day, personally. And I, there are some people I've heard on YouTube who walk with the Lord that close. Um, but I'm not ready to talk about that because that is way like one has to be really mature or really, really open knowing the ways of God enough that they're not going to fight this stuff. So let's just put the groundwork here and we'll just focus on the word. 
All right, so he made us sit together in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Now, if, in case you never heard, Kat Kerr explained this one time. She explained that the soul, the human soul, God revealed to her how it works and so forth, and he showed her it's like a rod, and it has like a, in a ton of layers, 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 layers. Imagine like a Rolodex, and or imagine it's like like a book. Like this is the, the soul, and it has all these pages. It's a layer. Of your soul these are all your different emotions and parts of you etc that at the moment of being being born again the lord by the holy spirit takes one of those layers and actually sits us in heavenly places with christ jesus because we are in him so those layers is the explanation why, uh, by how this scripture is true because literally jesus is saying here at the very bare minimum through paul he is saying that we are in two places at once right here in the flesh in the physical and he's literally saying he made us sit together in heavenly places through christ jesus christ jesus so our soul is also a layer of our soul is actually in the heavenly places with christ right now Boggles my mind. Don't understand it completed, but I do believe it. My spirit bears witness of this because my God is not in a box. He is bigger than that. So, verse 8, a very famous verse. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that goes back to Psalm 139. And I'll read it to you. It's one of my favorite Psalms, 139, verse 16. And this, again, I learned through Kevin Zedai. So I'm telling you, God, God has left a major imprint and a permanent uh, transformation in my life, in my spirit, in my soul, through Kevin Zadai. Psalm 139, I said, yep, verse 16. And it says, David speaking to God, Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So in simple words, <laughs> he's saying, you saw me before I was even created. Verse 16, that's the first part. In simple, simpler words, I'm reading it to you. And in your book, you wrote about me. In all my life. He, the days were fashioned for me, which means every day you knew exactly what would happen. And you wrote down the works you wanted me to walk in you. And you knew that I would because you know the future. And therefore, you knew that I would choose to walk in them. When as yet there were none of them, before I even lived any of those days, they were all, already written out in your book. So God has a book for each and every one of us that he prepares before he even created us. That's how much he loves you. And before there are people who say, because the devil's going to be whispering to people and say, oh, okay, well, if God did that, then why did this happen to me? And why did this? And you're going to think of all the bad things and you're going to connect it to God. Well, first of all, I have to say with love, stop it. Because that's the devil wanting you to connect the bad things that have happened to you to God. God, who is perfect, holy, loving, just. God doesn't do bad things to people. We're in a fallen world where sin is rampant and there is a devil who has a large influence on people because there's a lot of ignorance about God. And even upon Christians, he has a lot of power over them because they don't, many don't even believe the devil exists. Many of them don't even they, they're just safe, but they don't follow God. So, of course, they're going to be easily influenced. And those who are the remnant and who are seeking to be mature and those who are mature, they know and they watch what they say. They watch what they do. 
and they do their best by the Spirit of God to not give an opportunity for the enemy to enter into them, to use them, or to influence them, to say things they shouldn't say, to do things they shouldn't do, etc. And these are the people that the devil really hates. These are those that are a threat to the devil's kingdom. And so, the devil is the one who influences other people and causes them to do evil, which affects people like you and I, who are following God and seeking God. And we're just like, why did this happen to me? I serve you, Lord. I love you. I was just worshiping. I was just, I've been doing everything that I feel, you know, that is right. I'm not sinning on purpose, etc. And things happen. If we blame God, we're not very mature. Now, that's not an insult. This is just me shining the light on the enemy's tactics so you can be free. We've all done it. I went a time where I, was, I didn't want to live. I was asking God, you know, just take me now. But I had enough of the fear of the Lord that I wouldn't take my life, even though the enemy suggested it for a long time. And so, the Lord has a book for each and every one of you. But the devil is the one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So if something like that is happening in your life, by default, you should know it's the devil. Just make sure you aren't doing things that result and that bring consequences that are your fault. Because then you're blaming the devil when it's your fault. We can't be that naive, right? You, you do something wrong and there's a consequence for it, then that's your own fault. Don't blame God. Don't blame the devil. Take ownership. Repent. Apologize. Make it right if possible. And move on. But then... When you are doing the right thing and something happens to you and you know, first thing I always think of is, did I do something, Lord? And I start to think about it and I start to analyze. If, if I didn't do anything and I know it, then I know it's the enemy. And I don't blame God. And this is how you grow. And this is how you start to understand. So I pray that helps. Um, and th this type of stuff is, is explained in that book I was mentioning. It's rigged in your favor. Um, so, anyway, let's continue. Let's go on to... Let me just mention something about uh, chapter 2, verse 8. Um, this, this scripture... Oh, man, it can, it can go long. I'll try not to go too long. People will say what it says. Okay, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. So, obviously, we are saved by grace. The grace of God saves us through our faith, not of works... But, but, we have to understand faith without works is dead. So if I tell you, oh, here, see this sofa chair right here. If I'm standing up in front of this sofa chair and I tell you, I believe that if I sit in this sofa chair, it will not break when I sit on it. But I remain standing and I'm just telling you that I believe that, but I don't prove it by my actions then I do not have faith of what I just said. There's no action. There's no work to prove my faith. They're just words. But if I tell you, I believe if I sit in this chair that it won't fall, and then I sit in it, proving what I just confessed as my faith, then that is true faith. Now, that is a very, very simple and basic concept. So a lot of people will say, no, 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 you can't, you know... It's just faith. You just believe you don't got to do anything. Well, that's really stupid because God tells us that we need to obey. Obeying is the works part. But God doesn't save us because we're doing the works. He saves us because we believed and received in him. And because we did that with a heart of love, therefore, from that point, we obey. And then the works that we do as long as we're on the earth, we will receive rewards for all the works. But all our works isn't what got us into heaven. That's just the bonuses. Your faith is the only way to be saved. But your faith has to be shown through your works. I hope that makes sense to those of you. 
So yes, we do the works out of love and out of obedience to God, not to be saved. We can't do anything to be saved except believe that he did it all for us and receive that sacrifice. Amen. All right, let's go to verse 11 because this is getting long. All right, therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at the, that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been made have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Peace? You want peace? Get more of Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. And remember in, in the book of John, he tells us that peace, peace I leave you, not as the world gives. My peace do I give to you. So, there's a difference between the false peace that the world gives, false security, and that which is spiritual, which comes from Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body on the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Remember I told you, by that one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we come to the one door, the one gate, who is Jesus Christ who give us access to the Father. Verse 19, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. <laughs> Man, the moment you receive Jesus Christ, you become a family member. Like the Italians would say, welcome to the family, you know, <laughs> like that and all. You are a part of God's family, though you're still on earth. My God, that should make you happy. I should get excited. You should say, I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. Depending on which gender, because there are only two. All right. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building, that's the body of Christ, being fitted together, growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Paul really had a way with words. His Pharisee background, that knowledge came in handy when the Holy Spirit got a hold of him and he had the best of both worlds. So, all right, my friends, that is that. I hope this has blessed you. I know I shared a lot of insight. These are just things I have learned. Once again, if there's something that's a little too chewy for you, <laughs> if you're not too far along in the word or maybe you've never heard revelation like that before, chew on it it's like it's like i'm giving you some beef jerky or some really steak and you're chewing on it and you're just like this is really hard to swallow but you know what if you chew on it long enough and you ask god eventually you'll be able to chew on it and you'll be able to digest it and it'll come from here your mind and all of a sudden it'll go down into your spirit and boom revelation understanding will come it'll happen right down here and then you'll be like oh wow and you understand and then once you understand God can use you to teach it to others. Now, that doesn't mean you go telling everybody everything because one must use wisdom and ask the Holy Spirit. I felt I could share that in this video, and that's why I did. Um, but there are many times where I'm saying something and I feel the Lord say, uh -uh, don't say that, don't share that. 
things like that. And that's not just in videos, that's with people, with my wife, you know, having to, that's what a relationship is, the Holy Spirit to guide you what to say, when to say, who to say it to, how much you should say, if you should say it at all, and all this stuff. So see, a life with the Lord is never, never boring. So that is that. I know it was a lot. Hopefully I didn't lose too many of you. Um, you don't have to believe it all, but as I said, I showed you in the word and with the, the gift of the Lord coming forth to make things make sense. Hopefully it did. So God bless you guys. I'll see you here tomorrow or whenever you watch this for Ephesians chapter three. And um, I appreciate your patience as I know I'm getting this out late for those of you on the East Coast. It is, um, I don't even know what time it is. I think it's around nine now. So anyway, hope to, I look forward to you. And again, uh, the winner of the contest was Michael Guerin. I commented to your last video in my two video uploads, two videos ago, I commented to you. So hopefully you will comment back, leave me your email so I can reach you and tell you how I'm going to mail the gift to you. Kevin Zeta's book, It's Rigged in Your Favor. And you guys get ready, keep subscribing, keep commenting because there's a new contest coming soon. And in this one, I am, it's been placed on my heart for there to be multiple winners, but I won't announce what that gift is just yet. All right. Talk to you soon, guys. God bless.